Sound check, one, two, three. One, two, three, four.
Good morning, everybody. Why aren't you on the mountain skiing? I ask myself. <laughs> well, because I'm here. <laughs> and I'm glad to be here. Such good fortune we have to have this beautiful place and the beautiful Dharma, this whole lineage of transmission of teachings from the time of the Buddha. Anybody here for the first time today? It looks like yes. One, two, three, four, five, six. I always wonder, brave, sitting up front the first time, what if you have to flee? <laughs> Probably won't. Such good fortune. Uh, it's a, a kind of special day in that we have my dear Dharma brother Frank Lader with us from Germany. Uh, I'll say a little bit more of introduction about him in just a minute or so. Um, but I want to lead us in a, the, our traditional, what's become traditional here, our refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha chant. For those of you that are new, to the best of my and our ability, this is not a religious institution. This is a, spirit, a place for spiritual practice. And in that, there's nothing you have to believe. You don't have to, you, don't have to, you can't sign up. We don't have a membership. That's in our, in our constitution with the, with the state. That to belong, you belong, you participate. You volunteer, you contribute financially, and mostly you come and practice together and practice at home. Um, but the Buddha taught, the Buddha taught what he experienced. He taught strategies, practices, to encourage people to have the same experience he had, to wake up. And so when we, when we chant this, I take refuge in the Buddha, there is the marvelous history and mythology and 2,600 years of, of story, but what are we really taking refuge in? It's that which is awake. It's that mysterious capacity of knowing, which we all have in this room right now. For instance, please become aware that you're seeing. How did you do that? There was seeing and now there's this mysterious knowing of seeing. And then refuge in the Dharma. What do we discover when we pay attention to the world, not through our worldview or our fantasies, but what we actually experience? And that's the experiences at our six sense doors. And then the refuge in the Sangha is the community that's come to mean in Asia the community of monks uh, and actually the term for our kind of community, the proper term, quote, is parisa. It's a collection of lay people, non-monastics who are practicing, but we use the word sangha. We've appropriated it. And uh, so we take refuge in our community of practice, but I like to expand it out a lot, which is to remember that we live on a tiny blue speck in the midst of infinite vastness, and this blue speck is, has life. And we're part of that. At this moment, we're carrying that mysterious spark, which is, which is not there and in a corpse, which is, uh, which is something that enlivens us. And to take refuge in that, which we share with everything that lives. So I invite you to join in. We'll sing the chants through twice. This is a modern version created by Betsy, Ro Betsy Rose. I always think Betsy Ross. That's, that's a different, different anthem. And a good one. take refuge in the Buddha, the one who shows me the way in this life. 
Namo Buddhaya Namo Buddhaya Namo Buddhaya I take refuge in the Dharma the way of understanding and love Namo Dharmaya Namo Dharmaya Namo Dharmaya I take refuge in the Sangha the community of mindful harmony Namo Sangaya Namo Sangaya Namo Sangaya From the top I take refuge in the Buddha the one who shows me the way in this life Namo Buddhaya Namo Buddhaya Namo Buddhaya I take refuge in the Dharma the way of understanding and love Namo Dharmaya Namo Dharmaya Namo Dharmaya I take refuge in the Sangha the community of mindful harmony Namo Sangaya Namo Sangaya Namo Sangaya As we were singing, I was thinking how Ruth Dennison would be smiling if she were here right now to see this happening in this place that she was so instrumental in, in creating. And the fact that Frank is here. Frank came on a, he's traveling around the world as a teenager and bumped into Ruth Dennison at Brighton Bush and proceeded to come and visit her every year for decades. And we hadn't even met till her death, really. And then we discovered that we were twins separated at birth <laughs> and uh, sent to different continents. So it's with great delight that I introduce him to you and uh, maybe just say a couple more things. Um, Frank uh, lives in a in an extension of Frankfurt. And uh, he is the founder of the Touch Life School of Massage. And we were walking on Powell Butte yesterday and I was saying, how many people, how many people have you taught? And it's 2,500 or so who've been, who've learned this methodology of very mi bringing ma massage and mindfulness together and all over Europe. So he's had a big splash in the world as well as his Dharma teaching. So I introduce you to him and am delighted that he can teach this morning. Frank also is offering, I think there's two or three more bodywork sessions available. He's on m t tomorrow and Tuesday, he's working in an office downstairs. So Frank, uh, our details are on the website in the event post, the bottom of the event post for, the, for his teaching yesterday. Great. Frank Leder, let's hear a little bit of hand clapping. <laughs> As they say, give it, let's give it up for Frank Leder. <laughs> Here you are, let me. On. <laughs> <laughs> 
on. All right. Good. Go for it. This one. Super. Uh, Got to get it all the way below your earlobe and then bend this. Why is everyone different? I kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll balance you out a little, a little ear massage. <laughs> Yeah. There you go, there you go. Let me get the other ear. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> You're talented. <laughs> so, <clears throat> nice to see you. Who have I seen before in the last three years? Oh, so many. Wonderful. So, I'm now here for the next half hour to guide you in the morning meditation. And then after the Tai Chi and announcements, I will be back. And then there is more time for sharing in words. So, I will say a little bit in the beginning of the meditation and then there will be a period of silence where you can practice in your own way and then towards the end my voice comes in again. Okay, so, yeah, be comfortable in any way you would like to sit. And you're welcome to close your eyes or have them open, whatever is comfortable for you. Then just become aware of your body, your physical sense base, how it has arranged itself on a chair or on a cushion and what kind of signals and sensations it is sending out to your awareness. And allow a gentle swinging, shifting in the spine, in your neck, so that your body can nicely settle in, find a good position in that meditative posture that you have chosen. Wonderful. And then also be a welcoming, friendly host to any thoughts or feelings, emotions that there may be in your mind, in your consciousness. Maybe you want to name them, label them, if it's obvious what kind of thinking, what kind of feeling, what kind of emotion you are experiencing, ever-changing, very subtle. So having checked in, having welcomed both your physical, sensational reality and your thinking, your feeling, your emotional state, you may want to shift your mindfulness, your attention to your breathing, to that movement, that wave, that rhythm that is happening in your sitting body, 
telling you in a very special and very unique way that you are alive right now. The in-breath, the out-breath, So for most of you, this is a common practice, being mindful to the breathing. It's a very helpful practice to stay present or make a new beginning. And for those of you who are maybe not quite so familiar with the observing of the breath, just a little Reminder, a very easy practice to start with. Silently you can say the word breathing in as you are sensing that you are breathing in. And likewise, silently you can say breathing out as you are sensing that you are breathing out.
So we have about 10 minutes left. So maybe you want to relax your shoulders a little bit. Maybe you want to check back with your jaws in your face and make sure they are soft and relaxed and maybe also your lips that they are not pressing on each other but just gently touching could be helpful also to let the tongue in your mouth be relaxed softly resting in its bed inside uh, your mouth. So these little relaxation points can be very helpful for the breathing too so that your breathing is having a nice and open passage as it is moving in on your in-breath and as it is moving out on your out-breath. So we have some more minutes. Please en enjoy your exploration, your effort to be mindful.
towards the end of our silent sitting practice. If that was a good time, if it worked out well, if you are satisfied and happy with your meditation, just reflect how you got into that. What worked? What did you apply? What made you silent or peaceful? observant and concentrated. And also even if you were maybe struggling a little bit, which sometimes can happen, give yourself credit, appreciate your willingness to be present, your willingness to observe and be mindful and explore that process of body and mind, which is our life. So, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> Hand over to you? Great. <laughs> you take that? Okay, great. So, thanks for your patience. So, you want a ear massage as well? Or oh, yeah. <laughs> It's a new tradition. <laughs> yeah, I use my eyeglasses to cinch it down so it doesn't. Uh, there we go. How's that? That's very good. Yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> hmm. I don't always share the stage with this fellow. <laughs> So we get our upright position. After sitting still, we're going to move, but we're going to move very slowly. Just, it's like uh, ca it's calling to mind that we're mostly water. We're just going to pour all this liquid into one leg and then pour the liquid into another, to the opposite side. Just like we're uh, deliberately dispensing it, you know, just letting it flow easily t into a leg that's in touch with the earth through the floor and then w I'm aware of how it shifts, just like the tide. And that easy flow of, uh, th there's no resistance. The water just finds the, uh, it fills the container that it's in effortlessly. You know, it, it moves in without any struggle or conflict, just fills the container with uh, ease and comfort. And we can turn our, uh, shoulders a little bit and our hips and just face the corner and then relax one leg completely and then take the weight back and just sink into that other leg and relax the opposite side but turning at the same time. So the hips get into that ease and comfort
And then coming back to the center, we'll just lift off the heels from the floor, and just ride up a little bit, and lift the heels, then lift the toes, and feel the awareness in the soles of the feet. You know when you're tipping backwards, and you know when you're moving forwards by all the sensations in the bottoms of the feet. There's dozens and dozens of little bones and tendons and muscles have to work together to lift us. And then coming to stillness, sink a little bit, feel the tailbone. I was in a workshop yesterday and this woman was talking about, instead of four-wheel drive, she was talking about three-wheel drive, that there's a, a beam of light coming down your tailbone, and it's between your heels. So we can step out and just press and relax your arms and step out, but be aware that this beam of light is moving forward and moving back as your tailbone is being carried above the left side. Well, my left, you, some side, <laughs> the forward foot. My friends at the Native American Center always tease me when I say the back foot. They, they're picturing the back foot of a horse. <laughs> then we come in and feel that light moving down from the tailbone between the heels, and there's total balance, everything's easy, balance left and right. Then we step out to the other side towards the street and press gently and then relax those arms and lift and exhale. So you get the breath as a foundation, but then this, this light is moving across the floor through our intention of shifting the weight forward and shifting the weight back. But the reason the uh, subject was raised was she was teaching kids how to be aware of their body and be uh, self-aware. When they're going uphill, that light is, you know, uh, a little bit behind. And, and then when you're going uphill, it, it changes, you know, it's, it's a little forward. And getting kids to be aware of the movement of their body with a visualization of a light. Uh, that sounded like a great little technique for us old geezers, too. So let's sink and interlock the fingers and breathe in. And then breathe out overhead. And in. And out to the side. Uh, exhale. And just keep the hips steady. And don't shift the weight. Just keep the and then exhale to the other side, come back in, exhale, feel that stretch along the rib cage on one side and then on the other. Then release and sink. Interlock the fingers again, breathe in, and out. This time as we go over towards the street side, move the hip in the opposite direction. You get a little different stretch. Come back, and then towards the trees and the inner yard. Exhaling as we move away from the center, inhaling in. And releasing. And we'll open the stance a little bit wider and let the toes point towards the corner of the room. And as we sink, 
will try to send the knees out so that they end up over the toes. So you're not folding in with your knees and you're not splaying out. You're just following the direction of your feet, which are about 45 degree angle. Then cross your wrists and open your arms and pull a bow and sink. Protecting your knees, coming back and relaxing in the center. And then stretching out, looking to the other side, relaxing the neck, relaxing the shoulders. If, if we think of you know, using 60 or 70 percent of our uh, range of motion and our exertion, you know, just gently, we're still working the body a little bit because we want to stretch across the heart and the lungs and give those inner organs a little massage, interior massage. So one arm's pulling back, the other one's reaching out. But it's with a balance. Same effort to the right as to the left. And one more over here. And one more over here. We come back. Just let your arms relax for a second. Then turn your toes in and then turn your heels in and come back until your toes and heels are parallel underneath your hips. And take another deep breath. And just notice what the predominant sensations are. The feet probably, and the ribs, but then I was in a workshop for five hours. There was all sorts of little muscles telling me, you're too old for this stuff. What are you doing? <coughs> so we'll cross our hands again, and this time we'll press up with one hand and push down with the other and try to stay right on the midline. Then you're touching heaven and you're touching earth. Then release, your hands pass each other and the palms talk to each other. How are you doing? And then, so we're doing an a <coughs> asymmetrical stretch and then we're coming back to the center, letting the palms remember each other and then, And with one arm stretching up on the right side, you're massaging the liver. And when one arm is stretching up on the left side, you're massaging the spleen. So these two vital filters in your system are being detoxified by your simple movement. You're healing yourself. You're massaging yourself. And then relax the arms and feel the effects of all that cleansing. And then just uh, placing your hands on your hips in a neutral position, take your chin and turn it towards one shoulder. Let's say we're going to turn towards the trees out there in the yard and then out back to the street with the other side. Not forcing anything, but just relaxing and turning. At the very end, just a little stretch and then back. And you can do the same thing with the breath. Take a breath in in the middle and exhale to the side. Inhale to the middle. Exhale to the side. Then if we put our hands on the small of our back, 
We open up the chest a lot more, and but continue turning the chin, exhaling away from the center, inhaling in, sinking into the knees, a little beam of light is pointing down between your heels. So we have three-wheel drive. We have this flow of chi connecting with the earth below, and then we're just stretching the neck gently, but we're opening the chest across the heart and the lungs. And then we swing our arms forward gently till so our hands are opposite our heart, and the elbow's a little bit lower, and the shoulder might be a little higher, but the shoulders aren't hunched. They're just in a natural, you know, relaxed position. And then turn again, exhaling, inhaling. By holding the hands out here, we've opened the gap between our shoulder blades. And this is giving the upper spine a little massage. Just gently stretching. And we hold so much tension in the jaw and the neck and the shoulders. Stopping in the middle of the day and doing these three little positions you can go a long way to releasing tension. Okay, lower the arms and <clears throat> feel the effects. And just a couple more things. Just a circle with your hips. Notice all the different muscles in your hips and pelvis and lower spine and upper spine. Everything's got to work to get the hips around in a circle. The amazing intelligence of the body. I say something like hips in a circle, and then your body does all these little adjustments. Let's go the other direction. It knows what I'm saying now. There's so much cooperation going on every second as we move through our world and we're mostly unconscious of it. But when we pause, it's kind of awesome. A lot of teamwork here. Sink, open to the side. And come down the center. Gathering all our experience from a little mindful movement interlude. Hoping we remember some of it tomorrow and taking a break every once in a while. Once more. Thank you very much. Good morning, Sangha. I think it goes the other way. I always forget with this thing. All right. My name is Avi, and I have the extreme pleasure of attending to the details of this, of this community as community coordinator. And I'm going to lead the very ancient ritual of announcements shortly. Um, but before I begin, Kirsten, our volunteer coordinator, has to say a few words about needs that we have. And the question is, is the microphone, is the microphone working? Take it away, Thank Kirsten. Thank you. 
the magical talking stick. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm Kirsten. I help coordinate volunteers around here. Um, and we have so many wonderful people helping out, and I want to say thank you to all of them. There are a lot of consistent people that are helping. We're also needing some things. So the two main things that are at the top of our list right now, we need two more people to come onto the AV team. Amanda's up there today running our wonderful live stream. That's really important because a lot of people watch from home. Um, and we've had some consistent people who've been wonderful for many years deciding to step down, so we need two more to come on. And the other one that's just consistently difficult to fill is the hospitality team. And what we would really love to have is if you feel in your heart that you can commit to one Sunday a month that you can commit to regularly, you can choose one of three tasks to do on that Sunday, which is bring flowers. Somebody brings these every, every week or to help set up, make the coffee and get everything ready. And then you just have to come a little early for that one or help with the cleanup, which happens around one o'clock. So those three things happen every single Sunday. So if you could say like, oh, I'll bring flowers on the first Sunday every month, that would be beautiful. So if you're able to do any of those things or interested, please come and see me and I'll help get you connected. Thank you, Kirsten. And I would just like to follow up with that uh, with a word about volunteerism and energy and what it takes to keep this community going. Um, you know, you, a lot of you have heard this, this spiel before about the fact that you dream this community into existence. It is your combined energy that makes this place exist and it is the combined energy of a whole lot of people over a whole lot of years that have kept this place continuing. And we have reached in our growth a uh, a mismatch in our resource utilization curve where we have enough people now who are coming here who would, would like help with various kinds of things, who want to take from this community because it helps them. And we don't quite have some of the time enough energy to give. We, we, we are drawing on principle, as it were. And that's not a problem, it's not an emergency, it is the way that it is. And the effect of that is that there are times and there may be times where certain things don't get done because there may not be people to do them. Um, there, there is, for you alternative types out there, there is something called rainbow gathering that you might have heard of, which is a very interesting experiment in anarchistic social process where you get a bunch of hippies that go into the woods and there is absolutely no leadership at all. Nobody coordinates anything. I've, I've heard, I've, I've never been, but I've heard about this from friends of mine, where what, what happens is if people want to provide something, they provide it. And if nobody wants to provide anything, well then it doesn't get provided. And you get the very interesting experience there of where there are gaps. People either decide to fill those gaps or they don't. And to a certain extent, that's what we're dealing with here. So. My point in talking about this is to say, if you feel called to put your energy into this place, if you get enough nourishment from this place that you feel called to put some energy back into it, it would really help the community and it would help ensure that this community maintains itself in a comfortable way that feels good to everybody. And if you feel called to do that, you can contact Kirsten. Uh, by email, her contact information is on the website. You can contact me and then I can get a hold of Kirsten, but just let us know. So, announcements. There is an awful lot going on and I will just run down through the things. So today we have our second uh, Sunday potluck where people unleash their, uh, their, their traditional family casseroles, their secret recipes, and they share them with community and Five soups. People brought five soups. This is an embarrassment of riches, I think. So, even if you've brought nothing, come down and share and get to know people here. And uh, we will be doing this again in a month. If you missed it, there will be another opportunity in four or five weeks. Um, also today, at the end of the Dharma gathering and after hospitality and the social gathering, there's going to be uh, our new, um, our, the, the next installment or, or meeting of our Engaging the Dharma initiative, which is our uh, initiative about how we take 
what we learn on the cushion and how we bring that mindfulness out into the community in terms of mindful action to try and heal the world and make the world a better place. And we've been meeting about once a month on that. And in this meeting, Doyle and Kirsten are gonna be leading a workshop on um, basically listening skills for community activism. And that will start at one o'clock and that will go through 2.30. Um, then, um, over the next two days, uh, Frank still has some slots open for body work and the way that you arrange to take one of those slots is you either talk to Frank while he's here or you call his uh, cell phone number and all that information about how to do it and what you need to bring is at the bottom of the posting for Frank's retreat yesterday. It's on the, it's on the home page. So just look for Frank letter and you'll see it. Then Thursday, January 17th, this upcoming week, we have the start of the winter session of Basics of Mindfulness class with Doug Pullen. Registration is now open. I believe that there are slots still open. Then um, on Saturday, January 19th, we have Buddhist Movie Night, which is our annual uh, movie showings of movies that are either directly about mindfulness or movies that have a mindful quality to them. And then there is a discussion about them. And this month, the movie is Samsara. It's a 2011 documentary. The showing is at 6.30, and we've got details on the website. Um, also, on Saturday, January 19th, same day, we've got the kickoff retreat for the start of the uh, winter skillful speech class with Kirsten and Doyle. Um, registration, there might still be some, there are four slots that are open. So go, the, the information is on the website, look at the homepage. On Wednesday, January 23rd, we have the start of the Deep Dharma class with Robert, studies and meditations on the teachings of Ajahn Sumedho, venerated elder monk in the Thai forest tradition. It's eight sessions, it ends April 10th. Registration is open and details are on the website. On January uh, 26th, we have our volunteer retreat with Robert and this is uh, specifically for volunteers to spend time with Robert in a day of meditation and relaxation. And if you would like to attend this retreat and you are not a volunteer, guess what? <laughs> All you have to do is sign up to volunteer or volunteer and we would welcome you at this retreat. Then on February 2nd, we've got our first monthly uh, first Saturday day-long retreat at PIMC. We have these, we have these day-long retreats on the first Saturday of every month. Details are on the website. Then on Sunday, February 3rd, we've got a monthly orientation session with Robert, where at nine o'clock he talks about this place and the philosophy of this place. Then on Saturday, February 9th, we've got a visiting teacher coming to see us, Mary, Mary, Stan Cavage, I think is the way she pronounces her name. She's a Dharma leader and uh, she's a chaplain and details about that are on the website. Then on Sunday, February 10th, we've got our next potluck that will be happening on that second Sunday. Then on Tuesday, February 12th, we've got um, the next NVC practice group with Doyle and Kirsten once a month. People who have formal training in nonviolent communication get to practice talking giraffe. Details about that are on the website. And then Saturday, February 16th, we've got another visiting teacher, Richard Lang, who is going to do his annual Headless, uh, Headless Way workshop. Details are coming to the website this week. And then finally, on Saturday, February 23rd, we have a Remembering Death Retreat with Robert. Details about that are coming soon. Uh, Kirsten talked about the volunteer needs that we have. We are also looking for someone to coordinate gardening to help uh, put the garden to sleep for the winter and prepare it for the spring. Ah, so Tia is interested in putting together, or is interested in being a part of, she's not interested in leading it because, you know, who, who would want to lead something like this? But she is interested, she is interested in getting together with other like-minded people who love gardening, maybe three or four of you, and having a little mini work day where the garden is put to sleep. So Kirsten, raise your hand again. Tia, uh, Tia, 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 raise your hand again. So just go and talk to Tia and see if we could get a few other people, that would be really, really neat. We offer Dharma, cons Dharma consults on a regular basis and we're offering them today, today, Jim. 
uh, we'd be happy to do that. If you have an issue coming up with your practice or if you've never had a practice before and you'd like to start one, in 20 minutes, Jim can get you started. So just see him <laughs> afterwards. Really, it's not rocket science. It's not. It's not complicated. It's not like taxes. Um, let's see what else. Uh, we have other sits during the week. Details about that are on the website. Uh, we have spiritual friends groups that allow you to practice in other people's homes on your own schedule. Details about that are on the website. We've got our uh, transitions project for the homeless. That's what all these bundles are here for. So if you have small household items you don't need, please bring them and we will get them to this really wonderful project that helps the homeless in Northwest Portland. And then finally, if you have any questions about anything having to do with PIMC, my office hours are in the morning during the week uh, Monday through Thursday. And you folks out there on internet land, feel free to contact me too. As a matter of fact, if you folks on the internet just want to send me an email to say, hi, Avi. So I know you're out there. Because I do know you're out there, but I've never spoken with any of you. So it's kind of hard for me to like feel it. So just saying hi would allow me to feel it. So I think that is everything that I have. Cricket is raising her hand. Cricket, you, you know that you've got to have the talking stick or nobody will be able to hear you. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's on just right, yeah. All right, hold on, hold on. It was, it was on just a minute ago. There might be, oh, okay. That's what happens. You know, something tells me that the, the Native American talking sticks were not like this. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure they weren't. Hi, I'm Cricket and I do the bookkeep bookkeeping here at PIMC. If you have done any kind of contribution to PIMC during 2018, you've taken a class, you've done whatever, then you will get a letter in the mail that tells you how much you've contributed so that you can deduct that off your taxes. However, that will not arrive if you have moved. And what happens every year when we send these out is that we get this whole slew of them back again says undeliverable as addressed. So if you think there's any chance that you have moved any time during 2018, and you probably know that, then send an email to Avi and let him know what your new address is so that That's we right. can get it correct in the system so you get these and we don't get them all back. Thank you, Cricket. Yes, I get an awful lot of these, these, these mails that we send out. Um, and um, so, so let us know what your address is. And along the same lines, if you have been here before, you come here occasionally, and you like coming here, and you just sort of come and you go, and you don't really speak to anybody, we still want to know who you are, because you're a part of this sangha. Anyone who walks through the door is a part of this sangha until you don't want to be. And the way that you can let me know that you are here is there is a sign-up sheet there where you can give us your contact information and we can get you on our mailing list so that you can learn without any effort at all. It comes right to your mailbox um, about all the wonderful things that are happening here. And then you can keep track with what we're doing and you can make decisions about other events that you want to, that you want to attend. So please, let us know who you are. Come up and say hi to me. We, we love getting to know one another here. We are a, a very gregarious group. I think that is everything, honestly. So, blessings on your day, and join us for potluck. Well, try again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here. Right, it should sit right there, right? Okay. It should stay there. Here, just put it up your nose. <laughs> Hang on, let me bend it a little more. So why does it fight you? Well, maybe it doesn't know. Okay. Yeah? It seems good. You All know, right, but, yeah. Uh, Great. All right. All right, here I am, back in the seat. You're good. Thank you very much. So, dear Dharma brothers and sisters and Dharma friends, <coughs> this is my first time that, uh, thanks to your 
dear invitation, Robert, I'm allowed to share and speak here. And I think in the first year, 2015, I had you do exercises that involved meeting and touching each other and this kind of thing. <clears throat> then the next year, I was sharing something social, political about Germany, the refugees that had been coming. And last year, I was asking you, how are you coping with the Voldemort and the White House? <laughs> and I received uh, about 20 really wise answers, and that was enlightening to me. And today I prepared uh, a more Dharma wisdom, I hope, Dharma wisdom uh, talk. And I brought a book, it's called The Book of Ruth, of Ruth Dennison. And the story of the book is that uh, one of her closest students, Jane Hine, she's called, from New York, I don't think she missed a retreat with Ruth for three decades. She was really very dedicated. And Jane took notes from Ruth's talks and uh, put this book together. It has several chapters. And uh, so the focused wisdom of Ruth Dennison is in here. And the nice thing is it's free. And if you go to the website, you find a link and you can read it online or even download it to your device. So, now I have two chapters. One is called Awareness and the other chapter is called The Practice. And uh, I have prepared for both and maybe you can help me by raising your hand, you know, where would the majority like to go today? Hmm? Which chapter should we take first? If we have time enough, then we go through both. So, who is for awareness? Raise your hand, please. Okay. Who is for the practice? Raise your hand, please. That's about even. <laughs> <laughs> okay, once more. Who is for awareness? Okay. Who is for the practice? I think awareness wins by two hands. <laughs> okay. So we take awareness. Now, please. Oh, yes. I noticed that, but I didn't know what to do. Now it's better? Great. We are going to need this, though, soon, and I explain you why. Um, I'm reading you the sentence, you know, it's very short sayings, and then we let it resonate for a breath or two, and then <clears throat> if you want to comment on that, share an experience, or if you have a question relating to that, you just raise your hand, you can ask your question or share your experience. I hear it, we all hear it, and then we move on. We don't want to stay too long with one because we have plenty of her great wisdom sayings. And in this way, I want to go along. Uh, also, you know, being in uh, exchange with you and involving everybody who would like to speak up. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Awareness. Now, the first line is, bathe everything in an interested and attentive attitude. That's just the hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> now, first one. Notice your own awareness. Endless are the ways to be attentive. Anybody wants to react to that? That's also fine, then we move on. Next one. Awaken to this being you are.
what, what comes to my mind is actually a thought I've been having recently because I've been reading some articles about quantum physics and about just uh, various science things that have been happening like in 2018. And it occurred to me, you know, it is such an amazing thing. We are essentially made of inert substances. If, if, you, if, if, we, if they put our bodies through like some kind of like a, a special machine that sort of broke us into our component parts, there is no component part for consciousness. You know, it's like we're made up of carbon and oxygen and, and various metals and, and things. And it is amazing to me, I was thinking about how all of these things have somehow combined together and out of all of these inert things, we somehow become aware. That is a really strange and profound thing to me. Thank you for sharing, Avi. I think we can let that just be. Next one. Watch every action and motion you do. What do you make out of that? Watch every action and motion you do. What I'm getting with this line is everything is precious. Not miss one thing. There's one. You want to say something? Yes? Say your name. Your name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I say that there are two ways to experience things and they are thinking and feeling. Uh -huh. And what you just described is the, that's the medium of those two. Okay. <clears throat> thinking and feeling. These are the two things that are possible to experience. Is that what you said? And feeling includes sensing the physical? Everything but the thought. So hearing, Smelling, tasting, that is all in the feeling realm then, huh? plus the mental. Okay, very good. Be open and accept whatever arises with the clarity of attention without liking or disliking. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, you take it. <coughs> well, you get some exercise today running yeah. around. <laughs> Hi, I'm Caitlin. Caitlin. Um, it just made me think of a little story recently that my husband and I were having a dialogue about um, light pollution and the lamppost outside of our house that's very bright. And I was pretty annoyed by the light. And his comment of, it's just a lamppost was perfect and well-timed and comedic and yeah. kind of yeah. an inside joke now, but. <laughs> yes, so if you, I mean, this is something that uh, we have to practice long for to call upon it uh, easily and in difficult times, obviously. But it's nice to hear that, and your example is perfect for something that happens in our daily life, which is annoying, a disturbance. And, you know, if we get hooked on that, then uh, it's the light plus our reaction. It's a double dukkha, so to speak. And uh, this reminder, you know, is an invitation to come out of that. That's wonderful. Good example. There was one more hand to that, yeah? You want to stay with that? Okay. Thank you, I'm Connie. Um, I was with Ruth in the desert and uh, we were walking around the corner and she pointed to her garden and she said, what do you see? And I started to say, it's beautiful and she stopped me. She said, what do you see? And I said, oh, 
shapes and colors. She said, good, good, good. <laughs> Thank you, I love that story. <laughs> there was I, one more hand to that. I read it shortly again and then you can share what you want to say. Be open and accept whatever arises with the clarity of attention without liking or disliking. So when I approach that from myself, I have lots of opinions on all sorts of things and so if I can start with myself and, and avoid disliking or liking, um, then I can start to do that for other people, what they're doing and saying and their actions and what is happening in the world. So that yeah. actually helps me. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it also, what I get from your sharing is we not only practice for our own well-being, but, you know, the outcome of our practice, that we can be more loving and understanding with ourselves, reflects back into our relationships and maybe we are a more likable person then for others as well. So, let go of grasping, simply open. It's an evergreen, isn't it? You want to say something to that? This one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathy, and um, I'm I'm really dealing with that right now. I um, I just bought a brand new car and. For anybody who's bought a brand new car, it's like, you, you gotta be really careful about where you park and, you know, about how you treat it and everything. And um, I was thinking, gosh, you know, this is becoming like a jail, you know, of how I'm thinking about this car. And that's not, that was not my intention. It was just to have a nice um, vehicle to get from place to place. <laughs> And so I'm learning to um, balance out those thoughts so I'm not uh, focusing on bringing all of my fears to this car and releasing all of that and just enjoying it and um, being able to, um, to live my life in peace and not um, be controlled by a thing. Yes, that's very good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a good way of dealing with our belongings. Huh? Our we all have so much, which is beautiful. But as you said, the belongings can become a burden, you know. And so we have to watch that that we are able to enjoy them rather than that they take energy away from us. Hello. Uh, hello, my name's Juan. Um, I, I struggle with the, the same sort of thing a lot. Something comes into my life and I enjoy it so thoroughly that I immediately begin to grasp onto it as tightly as possible. And it seems to be that as soon as I begin to do that, I'm no longer in the moment experiencing the joy of whatever that happens to be. I'm yeah. in the past and in the future full yeah. of fear because yeah. I don't want it to go away. Yes. Um, I have a, a very bad habit of doing that, um, but it's, it's nice to be reminded. Yeah, and it's also nice to know that you're not the only one. <laughs> that habit we all share. I mean, that's the second noble truth. You know, the cause for suffering is craving, which is another word for grasping, holding on. And uh, it's very, uh, I mean, widespread about every living human being, that uh, motion, that drive in us, you know, something nice and we identify with this or we call it, you know, my belonging and then we grasp and hold. And in that is, you know, the seed for f further suffering. And um, in that uh, teaching that we have about the Four Noble Truths, it's clearly said that here is the seed for it. And if we want to find more ease and, I mean, 
an answer to the cause of our sufferings, then we have to look at that. And uh, in the meditation practice is a wonderful opportunity to observe the subtle grasping in us. You know, and if you under see and understand it in yourself in these times, protected and supported by teacher and sangha and, you know, protected uh, situations where you can train on that, then chances are much better to see on a larger scale in the normal daily life or in relationships how that grasping, you know, moves into almost every area of our life. Yeah. So that's very fundamental. And to acknowledge, oh, here I was holding, here I was grasping, here I was greedy, here I was wanting more than was maybe my share, uh, is totally okay. You know, it's, it doesn't say you are a bad person, it's just uh, you are noticing the second noble truth. Yeah, you're actually waking up to something which is uh, the fundamental cause of human unhappiness. So that moment where you are willing and daring to say, ah, here I was grasping, that's, you know, the way back. You are going home to save ground. And we have to do this countless times to really uproot this one. This goes really deep. Yeah. So thank you for those who spoke. Maybe one more to this and then we move on. Yeah, who um, wants to? So I wanted to just, my name is Vic. Hey, Rick, I remember um, you. Hi. And I just want to react to the second component, which was being open. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, I find that in order to understand what being open feels like, I have to understand what being closed feels like. And so there are times when I have to be aware of that and say, this is what being closed feels like. So I know what not being closed feels like. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, Ruth, one of your next beautiful discoveries. First comes the impression. And if that is not noticed, the reactions are coming. And then the thought. First comes the impression. And if that is not noticed, the reaction comes. And then the thinking. Uh, who would like to comment or question that? Hi, um, my name is Kathy again, and um, I just want to say that um, I, I do that all the time when I'm meeting somebody new. Um, I have a first impression um, of them, and um, especially homeless people. Um, I, I have a belief system that society has ingrained in me that um, homeless people are a certain way and a very negative stereotype. and. Um, I've gotten to know a lot of homeless people and they are wonderful people. Um, a lot of the people out on the streets are um, highly intelligent and um, they have held um, occupations that would just blow your mind. I mean, they're really intelligent people and um, they've chosen um, either um, through mental health challenges or um, um, they've just come to a place where um, corporate America just um, ran them into the ground where they are just choosing a different way of life. And um, some people are doing it to free themselves and other people are kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would just offer um, that um, for me, it, it's it's a trap that I get into every time I meet a person that I think that they're a certain way and until I get to know them, yes. um, then I see who they really are. And um, 
That's, that's been a big gift for me and a big challenge. Yes, thank you for sharing and reminding us to stay open to people that on first sight, you know, may not be, you know, our neighbors, but they can become brothers and sisters if you look deeper. Yes. I want to read you the next because the next two actually, one after the other, it connects to this. So we had, first comes the impression, and if that is not noticed, the reaction comes, and then the thought. So now connected to that, Ruth is saying, pleasant feelings can lead to desire and greed if you are not aware of the process. What is that saying to you? Yes. Pleasant feelings can lead to desire and greed if you are not aware of the process. There's a gentleman who raised his hand and also there's a woman that I saw. Um, something that comes to mind for me is uh, this idea that we can't, that pleasure is bad, you know, yeah. that society, yeah. you know, um, maybe old Catholic, you know, upbringing yeah. might, might make you think, but it is just a reminder to me that it's, it's okay to have pleasure and enjoy things, but yes. it's what comes, Yes. the process that comes after that that leads to the suffering, not the pleasure itself. Yes, very good, yeah. We need to differentiate there. I mean, not only the Catholic Church said that. Sometimes, you know, you could hear Buddhists say, you know, don't have too much fun because you could become greedy. So <clears throat> that has to be understood deeply. Uh, the way I see it, or the way I understood Ruth is, <clears throat> there is, <clears throat> something is happening. Something meets your eye, something meets your nose, something meets your ear, something meets your feeling or your mind. So here <clears throat> is an impression. The next thing that happens is <clears throat> you are feeling it, sensing it, pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. So Ruth is saying pleasant feelings can lead to desire and greed if you are not aware of the process. So if we are aware of this process, then there's no danger. It's totally okay to realize, oh, this is a pleasant moment. How wonderful. I can be happy. And this awareness and acknowledgement of the beauty, of the niceness, of the comfort, of the luxury, whatever it is that is pleasant to you, the sound, the sight, the smell, the taste, the feeling, huh? the company, and so on and so forth. If you are aware of that, that takes care that you are not grasping to have more of it. Because if that happens, then you are losing the sense of being nurtured and beauty, and you're moving into, oh, you know, I need more to be happy. And then you're moving away from the happy moment. So pleasant is okay. Wanting to have more of it, of course, is also okay, but bears the danger of the next dukkha moment, especially if you don't notice. So I think there was one more comment to that. Um, yeah, and Ben, uh, I think what you followed up with there is a lot of what I was thinking, but um, the I had an experience yesterday, we were driving out to Cannon Beach, yes. and I think it's an example of, of where regular practice will help you first even just notice the pleasure. Um, it, I, there was nothing big going on, I just literally just noticed my hand felt nice. Yeah. Um, and I got to have that experience for maybe a yeah. minute or so. I, yeah. you know, and, but it was, I, I really even felt that same idea of, I can sit here with this, Yes. And it's fine, and I'm gonna, you know, I do, there is that liking, you know, yes. but there's no way if I try to wonder why I'm feeling good right now, yeah. I'm gonna get it, you know. And as soon yeah. as I start chasing that path, they're like, you know, where's it going? Yeah. Um, then you're and chasing. it's funny because, you know, uh, you were saying about 
literally, literally a few minutes before that, I was grasping onto that wheel so hard, you know, <laughs> and so many times during the trip, it's that same way I found, you know, having to let it go. But, um, yeah. but yeah, sometimes it's just, it's really subtle. And I think practice helps you catch those moments. Yes, it does. And uh, before we go to the next, that reminds me again, <clears throat> uh, practicing on a cushion, you know, using these meditation techniques uh, is always a preparation to feel safer in life, in, you know, daily life, relationships, work situations, and so on and so forth. And this relationship was especially uh, important to Ruth Dennison. She was a very excellent meditation teacher. <clears throat> and at the same time, many of her sharings were about how can you apply that? How can you be safe and happy and less unhappy, less angry in your you know, real life, away from the cushion? So that there is not an artificial gap between a so-called spiritual practice and the rest of our lives. And that is so important, because we only practice maybe 20 or 30 minutes average a day, some more, some less. But the day has 24 hours, and most of them we are awake. So we have to, you know, learn uh, to look at the practice in a way that it can be applied not only in special meditation times, but if possible, in every hour of our life. Then we can progress also further. So the next one is related to what we just had. We are now going to the other side of the coin. Negative states are the outcome of the absence of awareness. Negative states are the outcome of the absence of awareness. Now, if you turn that around, it says, if you are aware, if awareness is there, there is no more negative state. Is that true? Please, yes. So, I think for me, this is peace of mind. Um, and I was just thinking that with the last one that you said as well. So you know, taking emotions and feelings and thoughts, whether they be negative or positive, just take them for what they are and practicing peace of mind mm. and just sitting with that. Um, because I'm very guilty of, you know, having negative emotions, being very unaware of them and very uncomfortable with them and grasping and grasping for the positive and feeling better and the joy and the happiness. But, um, you know, just learning to sit and have peace of mind with the negativity is, is what comes to mind when you, mm. when you said that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jason. <coughs> Jason. Um, I, think, I think this can be a tricky one because, um, you know, uh, no matter how aware you are, there's still, you know, uh, pain and sickness and death and these things. But I think the key is in um, talking about it as the, a negative state, which I take as more of a reaction to those things, which are really just, you know, sensation or stimulus mm -hmm. or something is that initial impression. So it's not saying, you know, that it, being aware means there's no longer pain. It just means that that response to the pain may be different. And often you get lost in story when you bring awareness to it. It's like, oh, sensations are, are happening. They're unpleasant sensations, yes. but the unpleasantness yes. state is the reaction to that. So. Absolutely, you got it. Thank you. Well, the next sentence sums it up, just what you said. When the mind is not taken care of, it becomes negative. Lacking, I go ahead, lacking awareness of our true nature leads to insecurity and fear. Lacking awareness of our true nature leads to insecurity and fear.
Uh, my name's Matt. I, Hello. I think, uh, I think uh, I'm becoming more aware of the fact that you know, thoughts and feelings come and go, and I'm getting better at just observing them and not realizing that the thoughts and fears are me. They're just thoughts and fears, and they come by the dozens, you know, by the thousands. You know, we have 76, what is it, 7,500,000 thoughts a day, you know, and... Uh, Unless there is really something that I need to attend to yes. that is bringing up the emotion, I need to face it and deal with it, yes. you know, go through it rather than around it. But otherwise, most of the time it's just, well, let that go or this too shall pass, you know. I mean, yes. It's just, uh, yeah. Like that. Yeah. Well, that's uh, already applying the practice, this too shall pass. Then you are reminding yourself about the impermanence nature of all phenomena and if it's an unpleasant state of mind that you are experiencing and you're saying yourself this cannot hang on forever this has the nature to arise and it will pass again then you're coming you know back to peace yeah i read it again um, lacking awareness of our true nature leads to insecurity and fear <coughs> cannot be otherwise, because uh, as long as we do not know our true self, our true nature, and I mean that's a pretty high state to aspire to, to really know that. It would mean that you know anybody's true nature. Yeah? Then you would have found, uh, maybe only even for that moment, but anyway, you would have glimpsed the truth. That's a very high state. And only then are you standing on firm ground, because whatever happens, you know what it is. You understand what is going on. You are totally clear, no fear. You know, fear comes when you are not knowing what's, what is going on. That is causing fear and insecurity. So <clears throat> as long as there is fear and insecurity in us, it just means we are still on the path. And it also says that, that is what I get from uh, Ruth's saying here, that uh, fear and insecurity uh, is not part of our true nature. You know? if, we are, if we have found that, then uh, we are safe. And this is what we will radiate out. You know? We know what is going on inside us. And then we cannot be shaken then the illusion has been seen through. And that gives you the feeling of security. <clears throat> More than status or wealth or money or whatever else you know, we could think of getting from out there in the world and then be safe. There are so many people who have all that and uh, if you get to know them more closely, you will easily find out that uh, they have no safety in them. Yeah? These are all crouches, and you take them away, then they are wobbly and fall over. So, uh, meditation <coughs> following a spiritual practice and path is a way to uh, gaining that sense of security, moving away from fear and moving towards security and safe ground. And awareness is obviously a key on this road. One more? Okay. Are you doing okay? Yeah? Are you enjoying this? Yes. <laughs> Who has met Ruth Dennison in real life? Okay. Okay. Who has read that book before, the Book of Ruth. So this is kind of new for you, okay? It's very helpful. I mean, you can just open any page, read a line, look at what comes up, or take it as a motto of the day that you want to especially pay attention to. Anyway. <clears throat> now here's a nice, uh, interesting one. The tree, the tree, and I, are not one, but the energies of the tree 
and myself are the same. Somebody wants to comment on that? Yeah, I just recently read um, something by, what's his name, Deepak, Deepak Chopra, Chopra, that we are made up of um, energy and awareness coming through the earth and from the, the universe through the nature, and we're all, we're part of that. And a big part of us is energy and awareness. And um, I'm still learning about that concept, but it, it makes sense, it sounds good to me, and I want to look into it further. Yes. Yes. Okay. Somebody else to that? The tree and I are not one, but the energies of the tree and myself are the same. Hello. Uh, I'm Susanna. Hello, Susanna. Uh, and I uh, met Ruth only in the last few years of her life, uh, but she moved me very deeply. And yeah. I'm not sure whether this came from her, but it feels like the same sort of thing, that consciousness uh, is not a property of humanity. It is a property of the universe, mm -hmm. and our mind or body or whatever yes. is like a receptor, uh, or like uh, like the eyes, an organ for receiving and dealing with yes. consciousness. Yes, and th and that concept just had <laughs> somehow a kind of magical freeing effect on me. I'd all, I'd been a I guess, worried person all my life. <laughs> okay. And? Well, it sounds like you unburied yourself. <laughs> With Ruth's help. With Ruth's help. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, so did, so did I. <laughs> so we have something in common. That's what I'm getting from that line. Uh, but the energies of the tree and myself are the same. That means that um, on a level of life force, uh, we are sharing something with everything that is alive around us. And <coughs> that lessens that idea of separation. And the idea of separation, you know, joins uh, with the ego, with the sort of artificial or um, yeah, imagined personality that we are all building and having about ourselves. Now, for some areas of relating that this may be necessary. But if that is the only one we know, the only rea reality that we know, then we always carry that sense of separation between us and other human beings and nature in general. And out of that sense of separation, unhealthy actions are coming, whereas if I know and feel and sense, if I can experience myself connected, that the life force that is keeping this body alive is also keeping you alive, and even the flowers and trees and animals and everything around me, then out of that acknowledged uh, relation, you know, out of a sense of oneness, a whole different uh, action and relating uh, is given birth obviously, yeah, then you're less taking advantage and you're more likely to observe if I, you know, act in this way, how will it affect this other person, this plant, this life around me, you know, more joining rather than uh, separating and then going for what you think is best for you, what you think, y yeah, you know, is your right to take and uh, one doesn't care about what happens after that. So that is a very, I think, uh, important realization. One more. To know happiness, you have to learn what causes unhappiness. To become happy, look at the unhappy moments. It's a typical Ruth Dennison saying. Now, who wants to comment on that? I read it again. To know happiness, you have to learn what causes unhappiness. To become happy, 
Look at the unhappy moments. Please. Hi, my name is Serenity. Um, for me, I take that as kind of somebody I think touched on this earlier, but um, kind of moving through being uncomfortable instead of going around it because it'll always be there. And if you don't mo move through it, then there's no way to get to the other side and, and leave it behind. So for me, what I take that, and I've been working, this has been a huge um, project that I've been working on in my life uh, is to kind of embrace the uncomfortable, the, the unhappy parts and say, hello, you make me really uncomfortable, but I need to experience you in order to get out and go through because I've, I spent too many years going around and then those, you know, sadness and unhappiness has just lingered. But if you go through, you can leave them in the past. Yes, well said. Thank you for sharing that. There's another person. Hi, I'm Sana Lee. It brought to mind the idea of a dark room with a candle in the yes. middle of it. Yes. And that contrast between the dark and the light and not really being able to distinguish one without the other. Yes. Yes. Here, Tia. I think when you start to look at your own unhappiness very deeply, you begin to see that you are the cause of your own suffering, your habits, your ways of thought, and that you actually have agency here. And once you see that, then you, you see that you have the control to, <clears throat> to start changing it. Yes, yeah. Avi? For somebody who has been so, for somebody who, for whom depression has been such a major factor in my life, as I'm hearing what people are saying, and as I hear you reading that quote over and over again, I realize that there is a distinction to be made because if I was still coming from a depressive mindset, it would be very easy for me to impose on that the idea of, oh, You've got to be mired in your own unhappiness in order to know what happiness is. But it's different. What, what she is asking, because I am very familiar with the experience of being mired in unhappiness. Mm -hmm. And that is not the same thing, because what she is saying is to step back mm -hmm. from the unhappiness, mm -hmm. even as you look at, mm -hmm. at what it's doing and why it's there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, thank you for bringing in that differentiation, this was the wrong word, for looking at it precisely. That's, I think, is better. I read it to you again. To know happiness, you have to learn what causes unhappiness. To become happy, look at the unhappy moments. Now this will be our closing one, because the time has uh, advanced. Um, Everybody wants to be happy, obviously. We all want to experience and find happiness. You know, this is in a, a nonchalant way saying um, to know happiness, to, be, to know freedom, to know love, to know your own true nature, to arrive, you know, in the light. In order to get there, you have to learn about what causes unhappiness that again you can translate, speaks to the second noble truth, the cause for unhappiness. We had that a little earlier. To become happy, look at the unhappy moments. I mean that's really uh, asking a, for a lot of willingness and guts and right effort and uh, also courage, you know, to willingly allow some up in unhappiness, to willingly allow pain and hurt and dukkha 
be in your awareness, if not your own, then also around you, because it's all around us, isn't it? Yeah. So she's asking to open, you know, not to close or show the cold shoulder or react and push it away, because that hurt, that pain, is not only in us, it's all around us, <clears throat> to a great deal, plus the love and beauty and happiness and niceness of the world. But dukkha is part of it. And so, if we want to learn to become really happy and free, then the way is we are understanding the cause, the origin of the pain. And we can only learn that by looking into it. Looking into it means you are willing to get into a relationship with that. And by relating to it, you learn how to, you know, get at grips with it. You understand and examine and explore it from all sides. And by that, you know, gained knowledge through your own, through our own exploration, then we can finally, you know, loosen the grips of that unhappiness which sits in us since a long, 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 long time. And we have a long time ahead and before us to work that one out. We must not be in a hurry. <coughs> it's a big project. <laughs> and <coughs> that, I think, could be the closing. It was my pleasure and I had great fun uh, sharing and being in exchange with you. I hope it was likewise for you and uh, really it's all uh, to her. If Ruth Dennison would not have taught the Dharma, we would not have met and there would not have been a book full of wisdom and uh, we would not have had this gathering. So I really want to acknowledge this teacher who has done really a lot of good on this earth as long as she worked on it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful life until we meet again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Not yet. In a, in a little bit. I think we need one more person in here. Who? Come on in. Don't be shy. Yay. This is the sacred inner sanctum. <laughs> so, dear friends, wow, lots of us. Please take a moment to look around at what we might call our many bodies, our many faces. Hello to those of you joining us in the internet. Hope you have some hands to hold. So, precious moments here, aliveness. Give the hand on your right a little squeeze and wish this person well. It could be any words you'd like, or a visualization, or a prayer. This is the intention. I do hope you are well. I hope your heart continues to open and the Dharma blossoms fully. And the person on your left who's been sneakily wishing you well while you weren't paying attention, get them back. 
May you be deeply happy. May the Dharma, may your meditation cushion call to you. May you have more and more moments of being compassionate, loving, and awake. And so to each other in both of these circles, to those of us in the choir loft, to those out there on the internet, to the people in the homes around us and all over the planet, to those beings who are in positions of great power and those who are in abject poverty, to our to those of us who fly in the air, who swim in the waters, who walk on the land, who crawl in the trees, who burrow, to our great family, may all beings merit from the beauty and depth of our practice. And it's now the moment. I hear the whimpering of the birds in the trees. <laughs> All right. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. Sadhu. Sadhu. And now, I did it, yay! Now, do you girls want to participate in the great candle blowing out ritual? You remember we count to three first, oh, okay? All right, is everyone in the room ready to blow? Do you all have a wish? Do all of these in the internet have a wish? All right, we're gonna breathe in. Not yet, not yet, not yet. One, two, three, blow. Yes, oh, we did it. Yay, everyone gets their wish. We have potluck. <laughs> Please join us for the potluck, and it really doesn't matter if you brought something. There's always plenty of food. And see you soon. Yay. Thanks, Frank. <laughs>